Good morning. Hope you guys are all awake after the late night boat party. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the Akiba front end framework, how I designed and built uh, a CSS framework for Akiba uh, that would work across both Joomla and WordPress and also in their standalone uh, products like uh, Akiba Solo. Um, but I'm going to be kind of doing it in a way that will be helpful to you. I think case study presentations are really boring, so we're going to focus on the things that I learned. Uh, so first, a little bit about me. My name is Crystal. My last name is now very difficult to pronounce. It used to be Harris. Now it's Dionysopoulos. Um, I'm a user experience consultant. I'm also a front-end developer and have been one for like... 15 years, that's my baby that's crying right now. Um, <laughs> perfect timing. Uh, if 15 years sounds like a long time because of my appearance, I, I did start when I was 11. So I've been doing this for quite a bit and I also do design user interfaces. But this is mostly about the front end development side of things. So in this talk, um, I'm going to take all questions at the end. I've left a little bit of time for questions, discussion, because if, uh, if you are planning on doing this with your own extensions, um, you're probably going to have some ideas or questions on how to implement it. I do want to warn you, I've done something that I normally wouldn't. I do have a lot of small text on the slides. Luckily, we're in the main room, so you should be able to read it anyway, but don't worry about writing anything down or reading too much. I'm going to talk through it, and also I will later today upload the slides and tweet them out so you can download them for your use. Um, the text that I have on there is smaller because my memory is really bad lately. It's something to do with sleep deprivation, I think. Um, and also to make it more useful when you download the slides as like a standalone resource. So first of all, I have split the talk into three different sections. At the beginning, I'm going to be talking about the pros and cons of doing a CSS framework for yourself, uh, plus the uh, starting project requirements for the Akiba framework. Then I'm going to talk about the process um, and give you 10 tips that, uh, that I wish I had known when, started the, when I started the process and uh, which will hopefully help you. And then at the end, I'm going to be going through the results and how, uh, how creating this framework has affected Akiba's extensions and workflow. So I'm starting with the cons. There is a lot of upfront work. CSS frameworks are not small things. Bootstrap was not created overnight or other similar frameworks, and there's a lot that goes into it that might not be apparent at first. I'm really not kidding. When I started this project, I was like, ah, it's going to be a couple months or something, but uh, partially due to personal reasons, but um, also just because it's a massive amount of work, you're going to be devoting a lot of time if you take something like this on. I think it's worth it, but be prepared for that. And uh, finally, it's your code, so you're going to maintain it. Anything that has to be updated as technologies improve, um, as your audience matures, it's going to be your job to keep your code base up to date instead of just downloading updates from a third party. But we think it's worth it. Um, we might be a little bit crazy, like the guy in the photo. But uh, I think it's made some positive changes. So the reasons that we decided all of this work would be good anyway is because uh, we wanted to stay visually consistent. Akiba last year launched uh, its new branding for the first time in like 10 years, which the wonderful Elisa helped with, gave us some great new logos and uh, colors. So we wanted the extensions to be visually consistent with that. 
Uh, it's lightweight. It's taken away all the bloat of bootstrap components that you don't use, bootstrap JavaScript. Um, it's made the uh, Akiba extensions a lot faster, so it delivers a better end user experience. It's easier to maintain on the flip side. I know that's kind of contradictory with what I just said. Um, but because it's the same CSS framework and the same version across all extensions and, uh, and CMSs, it's more reusable code. You don't have to tweak as much. Um, and you can make the updates when you want to, as opposed to when, for example, Joomla pushes a release and all of a sudden you have to update all of your HTML at once. Um, which is my next point, because you're in control of your own development schedule and can tailor it to the needs of your company and your audience. So our requirements were uh, everything had to be flexible. We wanted things to be reusable. We didn't want to get too specific with, um, with certain HTML elements. We wanted to be able to customize them based on the context of the page. We wanted to make it easy to convert to. Nicholas specifically told me to not make more work for him. Uh, so we didn't want to make too many changes to the HTML or the PHP. And we needed the classes to be really easy to remember. And then finally, we wanted to make it easy for the users to adapt to. Since I'm primarily a user uh, experience consultant, we didn't want to shock our users too much. So uh, in general, it's good to make either visual changes, like a facelift, like this was, or functional changes, like changing how something works. But doing both at the same time is a great way for your users to get really confused and possibly abandon your product just because it's become too hard to use. So in this case, we really just wanted to do a visual overhaul of the product, but left everything else the way it was. Everything is in the same places. And uh, Akiba Backup and admin tools, they work the same. So the process are really 10 tips which are going to help your process. Because when you're doing something like this, the whole point is that it's custom made and tailored to what you need for your extensions. There's no single step-by-step -step guide that will help you to, um, to do this for you. Otherwise, a universal framework would be fine, and you wouldn't even be interested in making something like this. Uh, Bootstrap is great at what it does, but, um, but in these cases, you do want to have something a little bit more lightweight and tailored for your own code. So first, um, the first tip is to approach it knowing what your audience can do and uh, what they can handle. If you know their technical capabilities, like you're aware of their browsers and um, location, you know when to play it safe and when to push the envelope. Uh, this is going to get a lot harder when GDPR comes into, uh, comes into play, because tracking and analytics and everything, it's, uh, it's going to sway some of those figures. So I would check that now uh, before you're disabling all of these things in order to be GDPR compliant, which you should be by May 25th. But I highly recommend pr future proofing uh, using CSS Grid uh, or modern technologies like that, Flexbox, because it'll help you long term. You'll have to make fewer changes. And um, it's kind of a good thing. So really, even if your audience isn't 100% ready, in your opinion, I think you should just go for it anyway. Because it's really easy to support older browsers using CSS Grid. Uh, even Internet Explorer 10 and 11, they just uh, require a slight tweak in how you do it. Internet Explorer and Microsoft, I think, actually were the ones that came up with the idea of CSS Grid. So their implementation of it to begin with was, uh, was different than the other browsers when they started implementing it. And now Edge and all the other modern browsers implement it the same way. So eventually, you'll be able to drop those fallbacks and polyfills. The other option is, of course, to, um, 
to just fall back to the default grid display. The way CSS grid works is you start mobile first, generally, so it's very semantic code. It's, uh, it's much better for accessibility, for screen readers and that sort of thing. And um, if someone's browser doesn't support CSS grid, it doesn't break, it just will default to that mobile view, which really isn't so bad if you've designed it. But anyway, I don't think it's that big of a problem. This is a screenshot from this morning uh, from Can I Use, looking at CSS Grid. And it's fine in IE 11 if you use a prefix. It's fine in all other modern browsers, with the exception of Opera Mini, but I'm pretty sure no one uses Opera Mini on their phones anyway. Uh, and if you look in the top uh, right, you'll see that the global usage of unprefixed CSS grid is 83.88%. So that could vary depending on your own audience. That's why you should know who visits your site or who downloads your extensions. But if you're just going in general, I think it's, it's well supported anyway. We used CSS grid pretty much exclusively for Akiba products and we haven't had any people complaining that it's broken yet. So there are some really cool things, actually, that you can do with CSS Grid, and I'm just going to show you one of them really fast. Uh, you can do auto-fill repeating tracks, which sounds like a bunch of buzz words, but what it means is that in Bootstrap, you have rows built by divs, um, and in those divs, you have a certain number of, uh, of items. So let's say that you have a row that has three different items in it and it's responsive because it has breakpoints. But using CSS Grid, um, when it's responsive, it'll auto just flow into the next row. It doesn't break if, for example, if you size it just a little bit wrong, you know, if your breakpoint is a couple pixels off, then you have uh, in Bootstrap, two items and then one below and then it goes to the next row because it's all block elements. CSS Grid just does it automatically for you. So there's this magic thing that um, has the grid template columns. It repeats, it autofills. You set the minimum and maximum uh, width of the column. And this is something that I used in, uh, in the Akiba CSS framework, uh, which was it felt like magic the first time I did it because it was like, oh, it just works. And I don't have to worry about rows, and so there's a lot, f uh, it's not nested as much, the HTML, and um, it's really cool when you re are resizing it and everything. So there's the link to a uh, code pen example of that. But really, there are a lot of resources for CSS Grid. Um, Rachel Andrews has a really great site called Grid by Example, which shows a lot of little snippets like the ones I just showed you, but also has templates already made for you um, using certain philosophies of a CSS grid and um, certain layouts, and it's just, uh, it's a fantastic resource. Um, Morton Rand Hendrickson made a great talk at WordCamp EU last year about CSS grid. It's online. I highly recommend you watch it because it's like mind blown um, kind of stuff. Um, as you're going through this, as I was building the, the framework, I found that uh, a complete guide to grid from CSS Tricks was something that I just had open in a tab and kept tabbing over to it. It's a really great resource of all the different terms, what they mean. Um, specific examples and how they interact with each other. And then there's always um, the Mozilla Developer Network web docs, and they have really, really good documentation of the specifics of CSS grid layout, what, what works, what doesn't work, and um, implementation ideas. So uh, this was kind of a little bit of a sidetrack, but I think it's really, really important to start including these modern technologies, because if we don't start building with it, then people, the browsers, um, the browsers already support it, but people aren't necessarily going to update their browsers. And I think, I think it's just really, really cool to start using these because your uh, HTML gets more semantic as well. Uh, don't upgrade to Grid just because it's trendy. Do it because it has a lot of benefits for you as a developer. Once you get into it, it's, um, it's a really valuable resource. 
So two, have a plan um, when you're doing this framework, but be open-minded. Things aren't always going to work out the way, uh, the way you want. Obviously, I'm really passionate about using CSS Grid. And um, I made a mistake of trying to use CSS Grid for literally everything in this framework. I'm, I'm anything that you saw, like the forms, tables, not tables, tables are tables because it's data, but um, I tried to do tabs in CSS Grid. And I spent way, way too much time trying to make this work. I was just so committed to this philosophy of we should use Grid for everything because it's great. And in theory, it is, it, it would be great because um, one of the big problems of tabs and the way they work currently on most websites and extensions is you have a list of the tab titles at the top and then underneath you have all of the content and they're not necessarily um, in order that makes sense. So I thought, oh, this is great. With CSS Grid, I can put all the tabs. I, have, I can have tab content, tab content, like an accordion, which is what it defaulted to in mobile view. Um, but with CSS Grid, I can like magic it and make it so all the tabs go up to the top and the, um, and the content is below and it'll be semantic for screen readers and I was just so excited. In theory, this does work just fine unless you have a variable number of tabs, which, if you remember, um, having really reusable elements and flexible elements was one of our goals for the Akiba framework. And uh, <laughs> I ran into a, a hard wall with this. There, there was no way for me to make it so you could have a theoretically infinite number of tabs. And eventually, I had to compromise my values and say, OK, guys, um, if you need more than seven tabs, you're doing something wrong, and um, just, just uh, talk to me. Because uh, I wouldn't be able to give you these specifics of the, of the problem I ran into right now, because it's been a few months. Uh, it had something to do with defining the uh, columns of the grid layout. But I spent way, way, way too much time. So when things go sideways, just go with the flow. Say, OK, maybe this isn't working right now if I'm just trying to get this to, to work. Uh, I think it was Steve Jobs that said, real artist ship. Uh, I was not shipping at this point. I was just like head down trying to make it work. And it just be flexible. Oh, and also, um, pixel perfect when you're designing cross-browser is impossible, let alone cross-CMS. So don't try to have pixel-perfect designs. As long as it's visually consistent, you'll be fine. As far as going into design, um, it's helpful to find your building blocks or atoms. Um, it helps, like I said, it helps you be visually consistent. It helps you create um, cleaner code when everything is reusable. I don't know how many of you have heard of uh, Atomic Design from Brad Frost. A few of you. OK, it's a design system um, where he starts from the smallest element and builds on it and builds on it and builds on it. So in the next few slides, I'm going to show you um, how I took one of Akiba's uh, views and built on it and built on it um, uh, in order to make sure that the code was reusable. So this was the, uh, it's cut off a little bit, but this was the main component view of Akiba Backup before the update. You can see there's kind of two columns and everything, um, but I was more interested in these little icons, these, uh, I called them actions. So for me, I started with these individual actions and I thought, okay, I need to figure out what this part looks like and um, make sure that I can change out the icon, I can change the text, the, the background of the icon is going to be different colors depending on what's happening there. And um, so I built that as kind of its own little, uh, in the words of atomic design, I think it would be a mo molecule. And these icons were usually grouped, so I thought, okay, well, 
what happens when I have several of these icons in a row or in multiple rows? And um, one of the things that I decided to do was use that little trick I had a few slides back. Um, instead of having bootstrap rows, we used the grid template columns um, so that they would be more responsive. They wouldn't end up, uh, the width would automatically adjust as necessary for the width of the screen, and they would also flow onto the next row if the screen got too narrow. Um, so that was my little building block that was made of multiple of these action molecules. And all of this was inside a, a panel, which had a title. Um, so I thought, OK, what is this going to look like? How is this going to function? It's part of the column. And then all of this, like I said, is, is part of the column. So there were those separate elements that I was able to look at and, um, and design based off of that. I went from the smallest on up because it helped me make decisions as far as what would be more reusable. So um, for those of you who said you haven't heard of Atomic Design, I highly recommend you check it out. Um, I know the link is kind of small as displayed here, but like I said, I will be tweeting out these slides. So if you follow me um, at Kristalanka, most of the slides have it at the bottom. This one doesn't. Oops. Uh, I, I, you'll be able to just click through there or just Google uh, Brad Frost Atomic Design because it's a really, really good resource for design systems. So tip number four, be consistent with your colors and style. This is kind of uh, tying into the design system thing. If you have a very strong branding, then this part is really easy because you already have good colors and um, a general idea of what things should look like. Elisa was great in picking some colors for us that I was just able to plug in as the primary color, the warning color, uh, danger, you know, some kind of red, and uh, uh, have it all look really good together so I didn't have to do any work there. Um, if you decide to go with an icon font, pick one. Make sure that it's uh, licensed for use in open source software, like an MIT license or something like that. Um, and just go with that one. Try it to be visually consistent. As far as font fonts go, I, um, I don't recommend loading your own fonts into the extension because it's going to bloat it a lot. And uh, it's fine to just use the default fonts of the CMS. So just be consistent in that way. If you don't have a very strong branding, um, I recommend finding some color palettes uh, using the, the, the mind is, my mind is slipping, I don't remember the word, but having the four points on there will help you find four different colors that you can kind of use for the different like alerts and that sort of thing. Um, there are three different really cool tools which will help you find colors that work. If you say have one primary brand color but not much else, it'll help you find colors that go along with it. Just gonna leave that up for just a second. And then finally, getting into the code bit of things, um, just use a preprocessor and make life easy. How many of you use uh, SAS or less? Almost everybody. So you already know then how much more convenient things are when you can have different mix-ins to just uh, generate styles based on a few variables, variables in general, um, so that your colors are the same throughout your extension, um, using little uh, file partials, which you can then um, organize. So this is just a general tip. I, I like SAS better. I don't know if Les does this, but I know that SAS, when you're compiling it, um, will cut out uh, duplicate code. So I, I don't know if Les does that, but, um, but I know SAS does so that your compiled uh, style sheets are not uh, a million nesting. It's, it's, it's as minimal as it can be. Um, yeah, I recommend... I know when I started doing websites and that sort of thing, I would start at the top of a design and just code from top to bottom. So all of my code was organized by the location on the page or the location of the page in the website. When applied to extensions, this would be the location of the view. 
uh, within the extension, but this doesn't really help you come back to it because your extension is going to evolve over time, things are going to move around, and then you're going to think, where did I put the code for that button which first appeared way back when I first wrote the component here and it's now all over the place. Um, so I have a screenshot of the way that I organized the code for the, um, the Akiba CSS framework. So I have an IE9 polyfill because we made the decision to support all the way back to IE9. Um, layout, a reset that we ended up not using, so just ignore that. Uh, typography, variables, all styles so that I could see everything compiled at once if I needed to. Uh, a folder for CMS fixes, which I'll get into later. Icon fonts, uh, we used one for icons and then one for also the Akiba logos. We had it loaded as a as an icon font to make it a little bit faster. Um, Mix-ins, patterns, which are like code partials. And uh, then I had three different compiles, one for Joomla styles, one for standalone product styles, and one for WordPress. So each of those three style sheets were compiling separately. And this was the inside of, uh, of one of them. So it's, uh, it's organized in there as well in case I really had no idea where anything was. You'll notice the little thing at the bottom. I hate IE. That style sheet was the worst thing. So in addition to organizing your code based on the purpose, um, I think when you also go and sit down and actually start to do this, you should start from the outside in. Start from the structure. Uh, this is working the opposite as the design system um, because, again, I, th I think, at least with the way I work, when I start from the outside and work my way in when I'm coding, not designing, um, I tend to write more semantic code because they're the bigger elements and I'm able to reuse it. So uh, it helps you think in a more function-based mindset if you go outside in instead of top to bottom. This is very specific to creating an extension uh, CSS framework, namespace everything. Um, we had, when we first started, so many conflicts with, with the uh, template CSS that Joomla loads or uh, different CSS that WordPress loads. And if you namespace everything, which if you're using a preprocessor is stupid easy because you just wrap it all in a giant um, like a Kiba thing and then everything is nested in there. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to target. Please never use important. Please just don't do it um, because you're going to regret it later and, and then you're going to have to figure out how to work around it anyway. So just namespace it to begin with. Um, bonus points, we also used a container around the entire framework, uh, around the entire extension view that had a um, an ID so that it would be even more targeted, more specific for everything that we had within that, just to make sure we would have fewer conflicts uh, with um, Joomla or WordPress CSS. And the reason that we do that isn't because the automatically loaded Joomla or WordPress CSS is bad or it has bad styles, but again, it's for more uh, fine-grained control because if you update Joomla and, you know, if you have an extension, your extensions are going to be loaded on so many different versions of Joomla or WordPress. Um, so you want to be able to make sure it's consistent across those uh, versions, even if Joomla decides to change bootstrap versions between releases, which happens. Don't bloat your JavaScript. We found that really 100% of what we had to do with JavaScript, like tabs and accordions and really simple stuff, um, we, we were able to do just fine with just vanilla, plain JavaScript. Um, Dimitris isn't in the room, otherwise I think he'd be jumping up and down and like screaming and being happy. Uh, you don't need to load jQuery 
on, it, within your extension. It's just going to bloat it, um, or you don't need to call it from the uh, from the frame. Sorry, from the CMS either, uh, because again, you run into the same problems that uh, that you do if you're using the default Bootstrap versions. Uh, there's going to be conflicts, there's going to be different versions, and um, previously Akiba, I think, had uh, a namespaced version of jQuery loaded just so they, there weren't any um, conflicts, but we were able to get rid of that completely because, because it was just a little bit of vanilla JavaScript. It's really just, if you try, it's not so bad. So, um, have CMS specific style sheets like you saw in the screenshot of the um, of my uh, files before I did have three different style sheets that uh, that were compiled separately and this is one of the reasons why using a preprocessor is so important when you're doing this because if you're using just straight CSS you have three separate giant style sheets that if you update something, you have to update it across all three. Versus um, if you have the different style sheets compiled separately for WordPress or for Joomla, you can have the fixes for um, just Joomla in a folder and, or in one file, load that into the Joomla style sheet, and everything else stays the same. That way, if you update a color, you have to update it once and then compile the two separate style sheets. It makes it so, so much easier than, um, than using straight CSS. And you get a bonus number 11. Uh, like one of the cons I said earlier, uh, it's not really a project that's over. Um, I don't think that I can ever fire Akiba as a client, first of all, because I'm married to the guy that runs it, but um, <laughs> second of all, because you need to maintain this. As things update, as the extensions update, you're going to have different needs, uh, and it's going to be a process that continues, just like any code, any project that you start, it's going to evolve over time, and you're going to have to maintain it. But it's fun. Doing this sort of thing, I think, I love CSS. I know a lot of developers hate it, but I just love it. Um, so just try to enjoy the process because you're really creating something unique and that you know is just for you. So finally, I wanted to get into the results of uh, Akiba's framework. For those of you who aren't familiar with uh, is there anyone that's not familiar with Akiba Backup? Don't be sh <laughs> Davida, you're a liar. You're a dirty liar. Uh, <laughs> um, so this is what it looked like before. Not bad, but a little bit out of date. And uh, this is what it was after. Ignore the green at the top. That's just so we know it's a development site. Um, it's a little bit cleaner. There's a little bit more white space, which makes it easier for people to to focus on what they're doing. This was the backing up screen before the update. And after. The, uh, the colors are coming across really fluorescent on the projector. It's not actually like that. And I guess you know that if you're using Akiba Backup. And Akiba is pretty happy about it. Because, like I said, the changes are predictable. He knows when things are going to change. Um, even though when Joomla makes a release, there's always beta releases beforehand. Um, sometimes, you know, they'll make a release and uh, it'll be, okay, I need to sideline all of these things that I was going to be working on so that I can update the, um, the structure of my extension so that it, uh, so that it works with the next um, with the next release of Joomla, and now he doesn't necessarily have to do that because he knows that um, I'm not going to make any changes, any massive changes to the framework without talking to him first, and uh, it's going to be in track with his own development schedule, so it's a little bit easier. The file size didn't increase. Um, which doesn't necessarily sound like a, like a benefit because it didn't get smaller either. 
But when you're doing something um, for yourself, and you're committing to building this, you don't necessarily know what it's going to look like when you're done. So that was a big plus, that we didn't increase the package size, even though we were um, doing everything for ourselves, as opposed to loading Bootstrap from a CDN or something. And finally, um, I think the biggest, uh, one of the biggest benefits was this from using this framework was that the page renders a lot faster. By ditching Bootstrap, which uses jQuery to calculate the responsive viewpoints and everything, um, the Akiba framework doesn't do that. So all these page, um, page redraws that were happening when, uh, when we were using Bootstrap aren't happening anymore. So it appears that the extensions are a lot faster which is really good for the, um, the end user experience. And also, not listed here, is that people were really thrilled when, um, when we updated the extensions and launched them. We got a lot of tweets, a lot of uh, emails about this looks great, this is a lot easier to use, even though we didn't make any functional changes, just changed um, the window dressing, basically, uh, of the extension, people thought that Akiba had improved like a million times. And it was just, it was just the aesthetic. Um, so it's a, it's a, it, it helps make your extensions uh, more modern and um, people like it. So that's um, all I had to go over, but I wanted to open the floor if anyone have, has questions or wanted to uh, discuss with other people if you're planning on doing this. Are there any questions? I don't know if anyone did anything on Slido, Slido. I don't know how to change. Okay, let's see it. <laughs> okay. Yes, so the question is, um, when I'm building this framework, or when I built it, if, uh, if I was using any tools to check it afterwards for responsiveness and for um, browser compatibility. I did. I, uh, there's a really great tool called Browser Stack, which, um, which I highly recommend. They do have a free tier, and they also have a freelance tier, which, uh, which helps a lot. Um, okay. <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay. Um, so, uh, Browser Stack helps you test the screen, the responsiveness, uh, a little bit more accurately than, for example, using uh, Chrome Inspector or uh, Firefox Developer Tools, because it's actually running the um, the website on actual uh, machines. So it's running it on a Windows machine. It's running it on an iPhone. Uh, so you see what it's going to be rendered as on a real physical device instead of maybe sometimes the uh, browsers aren't as um, accurate for certain things, especially when it comes to more modern tools like CSS Grid. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay. So <laughs> she has a question. She wants to know when I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, you can see the top one about IE9. Uh, it really wasn't that big of a portion of users cut off. It was actually um, just, uh, God, I don't even know if it was a couple percent. I think it was a couple points of percent uh, that, that were excluded. But we thought that since I ended up having a little bit of extra time to work on it, um, that I may as well try. Just It was kind of a, a, that part for me was just to see if it was possible to render this in a way that um, that could still work on IE9, and I think I ended up making it even work on like IE7. Um, I obviously ditched uh, Grid completely and ended up kind of using a separate style sheet. 
uh, but uh, most of it was astonishingly the same. Uh, it's just loading a separate style sheet. Um, so it wouldn't have cut off that many people, but uh, we wanted to try anyway, just in case. Um, consistent across your product. You know, I was thinking about this when I was, uh, when I was working on the presentation and um, also when I was working on the framework. There are definite pros and cons to both of these. Uh, work making your product consistent with your own brand versus consistent with the, um, with the, the platform that it's on. We decided to make it consistent with the brand First of all, because it already wasn't consistent with the, with the platform it was on. Um, Akiba started on Joomla and then moved to WordPress and um, also standalone. So a lot of it was already were, uh, very consistent with how Joomla worked when they first started and um, kind of evolved with it. But then you would go to WordPress and, um, and it would look kind of off. Um, so we decided to go with, with consistent across the brand. Also because Akiba has a lot of products. Um, there are the two big ones for Joomla. There's Akiba Backup and Admin Tools. But there are also a few smaller ones. Um, there's Akiba Backup for WordPress. There's Akiba Solo. And uh, we wanted to make it uh, consistent across the whole suite of products. If you just have one or two extensions, it, uh, it might not matter as much and it might be more it would, it would be easier for you probably to just forego the extra framework and just build it consistent with the platform. Um, another thing to consider, I think, when you're doing that is, uh, is your clients that are downloading your products aren't necessarily the same people that are using your products. You're going to have maybe an integrator downloading and installing something, but the end user is someone who has no idea who you are. Um, and then they fire the integrator, and then they're looking at the uh, extension, and it says it needs to be updated, but they thought it was just part of Joomla the whole time, and they don't really know where to go when um, they would maybe resubscribe and uh, earn more income. So um, that's something to consider as well if, if you want not just your client, but the actual end user to know where the product is coming from. Uh, whoever asked that, did that, was that, uh, is there anything else that you'd like me to respond on? Okay. And uh, do you use BEM? Who asked? Can you expand on that? Yeah, I did. Um, so the, the question is the uh, pattern that I'm using um, to name the classes when I'm building the framework. Uh, I didn't necessarily start with a plan in that respect, and I probably should have. But going forward, a pattern did develop. Um, in addition to uh, everything being namespaced, uh, since the code was organized by function, we were also naming it by function, so we would have a key like dash button, for example. And what we did was we had modifiers that were, um, this is something that I was going to include in the talk and then uh, decided that I might not have time to go over it. So um, I really wish I kind of had the slide that I didn't include right now. Uh, we had modifiers that were not necessarily attached to the class. So you would have class equals dot Akiba button, and then a space, red, and then a space, block, instead of having everything attached to each other, because it was easier to remember for um, Davida and Nicholas when they, were <laughs> when they were building it out. Did you like the way that worked, Davida, when you were doing it? Yes. Yeah.
Okay. Did everyone hear all that? Yeah? Okay. Um, okay, how did you test your CSS with older browsers? Uh, I think I, uh, I might have already gone over that. I used um, BrowserStack, um, which is a third-party service where you can test your website and thus your extension. Um, on many different uh, browsers and machines. Um, what would be the steps for a third CMS? Okay, so I'm not personally familiar with Press Shop, but I think the process would be about the same. You would, uh, you know, actually when I was building this out, I didn't use, I didn't necessarily implement it in Joomla or in WordPress to start with. I just had an HTML page, which I also doubled as documentation, um, that, uh, that all of the classes that I was writing were included and with the code next to it, because I just wanted to make sure it worked to begin with. Um, so I think that I would work from that way, don't necessarily write to PrestaShop because the whole point is that it's independent of PrestaShop. So write the framework anyway, as you would, and then when you go to implement it in the different, um, in the different platforms, then you'll end up having some minor tweaks to make, not necessarily to make it pixel perfect, but just to make it display consistently. Um, so I think that's the approach that I would take for that if we needed to implement it in another CMS. And do we have time for the last one? Yeah, okay. Um, do you think that this methodology could be applied to future mobile apps? I don't see why not. I mean, a lot, of, uh, a lot of the things that I went over today is just good advice when you're coding, whether it's a website or uh, uh, an extension. Um, I think it can apply anytime you're building any kind of CMS, like the tips about using, um, using a preprocessor, building from the outside in, it's not necessarily extension specific, it's just stuff that, that makes sense because if you, um, if you think about it, um, it's, it's more of a methodology than a, than a specific how-to, it's a mindset. So I think that it could be applied to mobile apps. I don't necessarily know anything about mobile apps or progressive web apps, but uh, if you're building a framework in languages that work for those, I don't think that there would be a problem shifting the methodology so that it would, uh, it would apply. I'm not sure who asked that question. I hope that was um, a good answer for you. Yeah? Okay. And uh, I think that's it. Thank you, guys.